Grace is yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God serving as our text, our psalm for today, Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. In Christ Jesus, whose praiseworthy deeds give life to us and to our children, dear fellow redeemed. Life was hard for Bill Grobe. Partly because of choices he made and partly because of the times in which he lived. Born January 1900, young Bill witnessed two world wars and like so many others suffered through that Great Depression sandwiched in between them. Later, a work-related injury and then a failed business venture put him deep in debt. In fact, Bill was 60 years old before he could buy his own home. And though he didn't know it at the time, he would live to enjoy the purchase only 10 years. Life was hard for Bill Grobe. I would imagine that he dreamt of a better life for his children and grandchildren. But there was nothing he could do to make that dream become a reality. He had only a mortgage to leave to his heirs. Still, he wanted to have something by which to be remembered, something to pass along, one treasure, a gold pocket watch that he himself had inherited and which he gave to his grandson. Bill Grobe, Grandpa Grobe, my Mother's father gave me his gold pocket watch on my 10th birthday, just nine months before he died. He was very clear that he wanted me to take good care of the watch, and then when the time had come, I should hand it on to my own grandchild. I've had the watch now nearly 48 years. I can't say that I've ever really used it for fear of breaking it or losing it. But I can say that thanks to my grandfather, from a very young age, I became familiar with the concept of a legacy, the act of passing along a gift from one generation to the next. And thanks to Grandpa, I've given some thought to my own legacy for some time now. What will I pass along? Grandpa's watch, of course, if it's still around. But what else? What treasure do I have to hand along? How about you? What treasure do you pass down? What will be your legacy? There's no better answer than the one God puts before us today. His word gives us a glimpse into our future, whether that be distant or near at hand, and through his eyes, we get a look at the legacy that can be ours. Under this theme, forward in faith. Actually, forward in faith will not only serve as the theme for today, but we'll soon become familiar with it as the theme for the building project we're proposing here at Mount Olive. As you walked in today, you maybe caught a glimpse of some of the plans, and you know very well that building plans are crucial to any project, even the one that God is working on. Because you see, God is busy building himself a church. Not a brick and mortar, but of living stones. That's how God refers to the people of which his church is made. Carefully, lovingly, he sets souls in place, calling them to faith in Jesus through his gospel. He does it down through the ages. It's the most important thing in all the world. And given its importance, you might think that God would place this work in the hands of highly trained professionals. Maybe, maybe the angels themselves should do this work. But that's not how God does things. That's not the plan he's devised to share his gospel. He's got a different plan. He reveals it here in the closing verses of our text. The psalmist says, The Lord decreed statutes for Jacob, and establish the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them. Even the children yet to be born, 
and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. It's really simple. God takes his word and he puts it in the hands of prophets and apostles for the purpose of proclaiming his holy decrees and his saving deeds to sinful human beings who in turn tell their children these spiritual truths, who in turn pass them along to the next generation of sinners who tell the next generation and and so on. Simple, right? But can it work? Can God really grow his church that way? Well, the psalmist gives us the answer not only in his words, but by his example. He writes, O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. The psalmist is taking his place in the plan. In fact, the entire psalm, 72 verses of psalm, it's a parable in which Asaph, the psalmist, presents the history of God's people, sins and all, And he does it with one purpose in mind, to reveal God's gracious dealings with rebels. And he does it because grace is something really unexpected. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you would never expect God to be compassionate to people who naturally hate him. And you would certainly never expect God to save those people by sending his own son to live our life perfectly as our substitute and then die our death in hell. You'd never expect it. Instead, you'd expect God to be angry with us forever and punish us in his vengeance. That would be a much more reasonable expectation. But here's one of those places where reason will fail us every time. Concealing from us the truth about God's saving love. A truth that would remain forever hidden and we forever lost unless God himself were to reveal this love to us in his words and actions. And that's exactly what God does here through the psalmist. Which, of course, begs the question, if it's all so hidden, how did the psalmist learn about it? Well, he tells us that he spoke only what we have heard and known what our fathers have told us. The plan is working. The psalmist came upon these hidden truths because somebody revealed them to him, his forefathers in the faith, his parents and grandparents and teachers, just the way God designed it. And now, fast forward 3,000 years to this day and age, to this place, and here you are, living proof that the plan is still working. God is still building his church one precious soul at a time, and in his grace he has now added our souls to the number being saved. How did he do that? Through his gospel, of course. A gospel brought to you and me through the people God has placed in our lives, A lot of you, like me, first came to know Jesus' love as infants at the baptismal font. How how did you get there? Carried in the arms of your parents. The same dear souls who went on to read Bible stories to you and teach you to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. The ones who who showed you how to fold your hands at each meal so that you would graciously receive the food God gave you in thanksgiving. And then because of the bedtime prayers they taught you, you fell asleep every night with the assurance that Jesus was watching over you, body and soul, keeping you safe through the long, dark night. Of course, your parents didn't do that by themselves. They enlisted help. Their parents, their pastor, the teachers at church and school, the youth group leaders, a long line of believers who invested themselves in your spiritual well-being. People who took the time, made the effort, 
to point out our sin to us and its consequences, temporal and eternal, not to shame us or scare us into better behavior, but because they wanted us to know what it was to be led to Jesus in repentance and thrive on the forgiveness he won for us with his blood. Talk about a legacy. We will forever, forever enjoy the gift that these people have passed on to us. Wouldn't today be a great time to thank them? Those who are still with us, of course. And for those who've gone on ahead of us to be with Jesus, how happy we are to know that heaven's eternal day will give us more than enough time to thank them when we're together again at long last. But of course, our deepest debt of gratitude is to the one who gave himself for us. Eternity is too short to utter his praise, which is all the more reason for us to get a head start, to praise him now, not just in hymns and prayers, but with our whole life. What better way to spend our time and energy than to invest these things in the spiritual well-being of others? Think about it. What better way to ensure that Jesus receives more praise than to share his gospel with more people? The psalmist urges us to, to think this way. He would have us look forward in faith deeply grateful for what we have received and at the same time looking for opportunities to share what we have received with our kids and grandkids. Trusting, hopeful that the blessings that we give them will bring them eternal benefits. You know that's what's running through the psalmist's mind. He's got this wonderful gift that his forefathers in the faith have placed into his hands and as he cherishes the gift, he realizes it's not for him alone. So now he's thinking about ways to pass it on. He says, we will not hide them, these spiritual truths we have, from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. I find it interesting that Asaph refers to their children. He's talking about the children of his spiritual forefathers, our spiritual forefathers, people who had the big picture in mind when they entrusted the gospel to our care. They did this confident that the gospel seed they were planting would bear them many generations of spiritual descendants, some of whom would be in their bloodline, but all would be their family in Christ. We've talked about some of these people already, those nearest and dearest, parents and grandparents. But think beyond their number. Think about the people who founded this congregation more than 100 years ago. The people who made sure that we had a building in which to worship and a school for our children to attend. They didn't even know our names. And yet they thought of us just the same. Though we were not born, they sacrificed and cared for us as if we were their children. Because in a very real sense, we are their children in Christ. And now it's our turn to make sure that all that these people have done doesn't stop with us. That it doesn't come to a crashing halt. It's our turn to look for ways to pass along the gospel of Jesus and make sure that it is not hidden from our children or their children or the generations to come after that. But is that really a concern? Could that somehow happen? Will you tell me? The gospel is hidden when it is no longer front and center in our lives. It's hidden when we devote ourselves to other priorities. 
If someone were to ask your children or grandchildren what they believe is most important to you, how would your family members answer? What would they say? Based on how you spend your time and energy, based on the things you say and do, how would the people close to you judge your priorities? I'll ask it another way. When you're no longer here on earth, what will your children say is the most important thing they learn from you? What will your legacy be? Every once in a while, I see this bumper sticker. I'm sure you do too. We're spending our kids' inheritance. It brings a smile to the face it's meant to, but I wonder sometimes if it's also offered up as a bit of an apology. No apology is ever necessary when we are spending our children's spiritual inheritance. If you understand that to mean that we are enjoying the very gospel that we're trying to share with our family. When your children and grandchildren see that God's forgiveness in Christ is the most important thing in your life, it will make a lasting impression on them. When they watch as you live confident that God is busy making all things serve your good for the sake of Christ, it'll give them pause to stop and consider the circumstances of their own life and what God may be working there. And when the day comes and they see you face death unafraid because you know that Jesus has earned a place for you in heaven, it will bring your loved ones the greatest comfort they can have. They will put their trust in God and they will not forget his praiseworthy deeds. I know that from experience. I told you about Grandpa Grobe's hard life. It was a life made much more difficult than it needed to be because Grandpa made no time for Jesus. In fact, for most of his adult life, he considered himself an atheist. I watched the pain and concern that caused my mother as she lived with the reality that her father would perish in hell. I saw my parents make the most of every opportunity to share the gospel with Jesus every chance they got. Even making missionaries out of my sister and me, the plan was Sunday afternoon you each sit on one side of Grandpa and you tell him everything you learned in Sunday school this morning. It went on for years with no change that we could ever see. But then in July of 1970, Grandpa suffered a major stroke. He was rushed to the hospital. Time was short. My parents enlisted the help of our pastor, Pastor Stensberg. Now the gospel had its way with Bill Grobe. It worked its miracle of faith in his heart. Grandpa lived seven more days, seven days filled with peace, and joy and gratitude on his part and ours. As it turns out, a watch is a pretty fitting legacy from a man whose life taught me time is of the essence. And so it is. Now is the time to look forward in faith for the opportunities we have to share what we have so graciously received with our children and their children and with generations yet unborn, hopeful that the gospel we proclaim will bring eternal benefits. We know it will. It must. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.